Right, if you want to buy any of these leather jackets new, um, this one from Sharp, for example, the 118, it's going to run you about a thousand. That is in Europe. If you want to buy this one here from Simmons Built, then I think it's yeah just over a thousand. And then maybe this one from Vanson, if you factor in the the shipping and the import duties and all of that. It's also going to run you about a grand. Now this isn't me flexing, not at all. This is me trying to illustrate that leather jackets are fucking expensive. So if somebody reaches out to me and says that they can do a custom made leather jacket for $250, I'm skeptical, certainly, but I'm still curious. Okay, this is a tricky one, I must admit. Because I really don't like doing videos where I, I shit on things. I'd much rather spend my time doing something that I can be positive about and something that I can recommend. And also, if I get something for free, I got this for free. I want to be able to provide some value to the maker or to the brand that I got it from. Okay, so why, when I was so skeptical about a made-to-measure leather jacket for $250, why did I say yes to this one? Okay, hmm. How do you explain this? Because this does really up a whole Pandora's box of, of prejudices to be quashed, of, of assumptions to be challenged and for, for conversations to be started. Hmm. Okay, actually, before I go any further, I'm about to step up in a soapbox. So if you're just here for the jacket review, you can skip to this time frame. Okay, let's, let's roll with it like this. So you guys know that I work with 316, right? Well, last year, 316 started proudly producing in India. They also started producing in Peru and Italy, but for the sake of this discussion, let's just stick to India. And for a brand that was, actually still is, made in America with Japanese denim, this was quite a departure, just for the, the point of view of the, the brand's perception. And yeah, I'll admit, when I first heard that this was happening, I was really like, hmm, okay, um, let's see. But when I say proudly made in India, I really do mean proudly because there is a lot to be proud of there. There's simply things that can be done in this Indian mill, this Indian factory, that literally can't be done anywhere else. This isn't about driving down price, not at all. It's just the fact that this, this Indian production facility, this factory, possesses the skills, the knowledge, the know-how to produce some truly incredible fabrics. Hand-woven, hand-dyed, block-printed. I mean, these are skills that could once have been done in, in Europe, in, in the US, in, in Japan. You know, all these places that we associate with, with high-quality manufacture. But the skills and the infrastructure and the ability to make these fabrics in, in any meaningful quantity, they're gone. And then there's the production of the garments actually sewing this fabric into a shirt or a pair of trousers or whatever it might be. 316 are also doing this in India. And the guys there are doing such an amazing job. It makes sense from the, the perspective of making the best quality garment from the, the most amazing fabrics you could possibly think of. And it also makes sense from a, a sustainability point of view. I mean, why bother making this fabric there and then shipping it all the way around the world to another factory for it to be sewn into garments, and then they've got to be shipped out again. That's just, it, it just doesn't make sense. So I guess the conversation shifts from, yeah, okay, we're making this in America because this is the best place to make it, and that coming with its own certain brand of associations, to we are looking for the best possible places to make this thing, whatever this thing might be. As I said, some of the pieces are still made in America. The jeans are still made in America because that's the, the best place that you can make them. The denim is still woven in Japan because that's the best place you can find this denim. But okay, back to my, my point. Right, there is this very deep-seated presumption, association that made in India, made in China, made in Bangladesh means bad quality and very, very poor sustainability and labor practices. And then it means that a brand has, has sold out and is just like looking to rinse every last cent out of their bottom line. But I can assure you, in this case, this is total and utter horseshit. It's a prejudice, 
plain and simple. And it's a prejudice that we have to get over in order to ensure that this doesn't become a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, imagine that there were no brands like 316, like, like 18 East, like Story Manufacturing. Guys that are brave enough to stand up and just go like, can we just look at this please? Can we see what these guys can do and look how amazing it is? And yeah, guys that are strong enough to to weather the inevitable shitstorm that these kind of moves stirs up. So yeah, imagine that there was no brand that, that could showcase, that could illustrate and could take advantage, uh, not in an exploitive way, but in a creative way, take advantage of what these producers are really capable of. Imagine there was just this kind of brand that really were just concentrated absolutely on wringing out every last cent of profit they possibly could from whatever it was they're producing. They'd be going over there saying like, okay, we need exactly what everybody else is making, we just need it cheaper. We don't need any of that craft and quality. That, that's, that's not important. And also like really, how shit can we make this so the person needs to replace it as quickly as possible? And then is driven just to replace it again and again to buy more, more and more. I mean, I, I think you know that what I've just described there is the the vast majority of the garment industry. So yeah, there's only this kind of brand. And they, they go over to India, they look for, for a factory that's gonna be able to produce this, this cheap stuff. They maybe even find the, the factory that the 316 is producing it. And since there's no other game in town, then this factory does have to adapt to their demands. This factory, it, it needs to take it or it shuts down. And so a downward spiral just begins. Like that, that craft, that quality, that expertise, it's not needed anymore. And I guess that gets forgotten super fucking quick because they are churning through people at a tremendous rate, just trying to match the unreasonable demands of the, these bigger brands. And then corners start to be cut because of these unreasonable demands. So the, the first thing is probably worker well-being and then environmental impact. The quality, I mean, that, that corner was cut long before because that was actually one of the demands. And in the end, it becomes exactly what we thought it was. And it is totally our fault. It's our fault for expecting jeans that cost 20 bucks and t-shirts that cost less than a coffee. And it's our fault for holding on to this prejudice that anything that's produced in India, in Bangladesh, in China, basically anywhere where you find a Primark production facility, that these products are of uh, a lower quality and that the brands that have sourced their products and their production from these places have sold out. We really do need to get this notion out of our thick skulls. Because you know guys, and I'm talking to you, to you here, us denim heads, we are a pretty stubborn lot. And seriously, fuck, I have been so guilty of this in the past. So yeah, we are a stubborn lot and it really takes a lot of time for us to to come round to a, a different perspective. But anyway, right, I'm getting off my soapbox now by getting out of my chair. And you're probably wondering what all this has to do with, with this year jacket. But all that was just to, to prime my point on the, the country of origin associations, presumptions, prejudices. Because this jacket is made in Pakistan and on face value, I will say right away that it does lean or it seems to lean slightly heavier towards the negative associations that we just spoke about. But the thing is, and I, I really do mean this, this is a very well-made jacket. Whoever put this together from the fit to the features to the quality of the construction, they really knew what they were doing. It's just that the materials that it's been made with yeah, sorry, they are really not great. Like, not at all. So, yeah, to the jacket maker that sent me this jacket. That's the name of the brand, not the guy that actually made it. But to the jacket maker, I know this is probably not what you were hoping for when you sent me over this jacket. But what I'm going to, to try to do here to, to bring something positive out of this is to provide a little bit of product consultancy. Something that you, you better believe I charge a lot more for than the cost of this jacket. So I really am hoping that you're gonna see this as a, a net positive 
rather than being pissed that you're not getting like a big thumbs up and a gold star. I think you really are going to find more value in that in the long run. At least I, I would hope so. First off, know your audience or at least know the audience of the guys that you're seeding. I am certain that there's creators, there's influencers out there that are going to reach the, the audience that you're trying to target with this jacket. It's not me. My audience, I think, uh, at least the perception of my audience and the this audience that I try to create for, they are super far from, from the guys who are going to find value in a piece like this. However, and this is the kind of thing that kind of gets me, gets my blood up, you've clearly, you've demonstrated the skills that you can really create a jacket that would definitely, definitely resonate with, with my audience. It would just take like a, a little bit more of an understanding of, of what we value. So good materials, ethical practices, because you already have the details, the craftsmanship and the fit just down. And speaking of the fit, this fit is amazing. It is uh, a contemporary take on the G1, but the, the, the proper Repro G1s, they are boxy, they are quite short, and to be honest, they're not that flattering. For me, this just works way, way better. Honestly, if this was in a decent leather, I would take this over a G1 Repro from Buzz Rickson's, from the Real McCoy's, from Eastman Leathers, any of these guys. And the range of jackets that the jacket maker actually has is quite astonishing. There really is something for, for everybody there. I really, I try not to judge. I don't do it very well all the time, but I, I do try not to judge. Size-wise, I think I would, if I was doing it again, go up one size. I mean, this is no criticism and no fault of the jacket maker. It's just that I put in my sizes and this is what I got out. I, this is, so I'm a 42 by their measurements. That corresponds to an extra large. And I guess I would need an extra, extra large. And this brings me to my first piece of constructive criticism, or criticism that I hope you're gonna take in a constructive way. Maybe think about skewing your sizes a little bit more towards the norm in the US and, and Europe. I mean, I am a large across the board in all US and European sizes. So I wouldn't expect to go for an extra extra large, which is what I would end up needing, I think. Okay, but that's honestly not important. If you stick to the measuring guide, which incidentally is one of the best measuring guides that I've ever seen out there for measuring up tops, if you stick to that, then you're gonna be pretty much fine with the sizes. I'm fine with this size, like really. It's great if I'm just wearing a t-shirt underneath it. Might get a little bit tight if I'm wearing a bulkier hoodie, that's all. Okay, but right, we're moving on to the leather, and unfortunately, that's where things start to fall apart. I mean, yeah, hopefully not literally, but yeah, the leather. You know how they say that the first impressions are important? Well, when I, I got the box and I was opening it up, came in a plastic bag, I opened up the plastic bag and then instantly I was just hit in the face with this Overwhelm sm overwhelming smell of plastic. I mean, my, my girlfriend, she was across the room and she instantly said like, huh, what's that? Like, yeah, put it back in the bag. You can look at that when you're in the office. It was just, it's a strange thing to receive a leather jacket and to open the bag and have this really strong smell of plastic. It's incongruous, incongruous, Incong it doesn't make sense. And then when we dive a little deeper, I mean, I am all for a lightweight leather jacket. I actually, I prefer that nowadays to, to the heavier leathers. It's just, it's more practical, it's more wearable. But yeah, this really does feel like plastic. I am not an expert in leathers, like not at all. And I, I know that there's a lot of liberties you can take when describing a leather. But yeah, I'm sure this was once an animal. I don't think you can take that much of a liberty, but I can't even imagine the, the processes and the treatments that this has gone through to take it from whatever animal it once was to what's been sewn into a jacket here. 
and I also really have my reservations about how long this is going to last and how well it is going to wear. It's there's one positive thing is there's going to be absolutely no break-in period, but there's also going to be no chance of getting a patina on this. And I do have a feeling I, I've seen little bits here and there where it looks like almost the top surface of the leather has sort of chipped off. And that does make me concerned about how long this is going to look good. And I don't think it's going to look better with time and wear. I think it's actually going to look worse. Right, but let's let's get further into the details. Let's let's look at the waistband and the cuffs. These are some kind of, of knitted elasticated cotton. And these are really, really good. Like this is exactly the kind of thing that I'd expect to see in even the highest end leather jacket. These have got some bulk, they've, they've got some rigidity, they've got some heft to them, and they spring back super nicely. They're very, very soft, very well made. It's kind of, it's not in keeping with, with the leather, not at all. And so then from the cuffs and the waistband to, to the lining. Um, this is fine, it's okay. It doesn't impress me, but it doesn't really bother me. I think it's some sort of nylon material, maybe and it's, it's quilted, it, it does the job fine. On the, the lining of the sleeves, I think it's the same material, it's just not quilted. And I do like to see this, you guys know that I, I, I would want the, the body of the jacket maybe lined in a cotton twill, but on the sleeves, I'm happy to see a slightly more slippy material that gives you more ease when you're putting the jacket on if you're wearing a shirt or a jumper underneath and also gives you more ease of movement when you're actually wearing the jacket. And then we have got a couple of inside pockets. They are both a good size. And I think that they are, the, the pocket bags are the same material that's used for the, the quilted lining and the, the lining of the arms. And one really nice thing is that they're, they're anchored down at the bottom. So if you're trying to pull something out of your pocket, you're not gonna pull the whole pa pocket bag out. Um, that's something that I think even the, the highest end jacket manufacturers could learn from. I, I really like that, I've not seen that before. Then we have got a couple of woven labels. We've got the jacket maker logo up here at the neck and that is set on uh, the same leather that the outside of the jacket's made from. That looks good, it's a nice touch. And then it's got the size as well, XL, and we spoke about that before. Then we have got the care label down here. Uh, real leather, um, yeah. Commonly made of lamb, sheep, calf, and cowhide. And a little symbol of something that looks like a beaver or a salamander that's missing his tail. But yeah, but anyway, so commonly made of lamb, sheep, calf, or cowhide. That is a little bit too unspecific for my liking. Which swings it back to the question of the leather that this jacket's made out of. It's not enough to make this jacket out of a better leather. You have to engage the consumer about the kind of leather, leathers that, that you use and you have to illustrate this in some fashion. You have to really engage the person that's buying it right from the beginning, right from the raw materials. Tell us about the tannery, tell us about the, the types of leather, the qualities inherent in certain types of leather. Tell us about uh, the, the different leathers that you offer, maybe a little bit about the history of why you, you're using a certain leather in a specific jacket. I mean, the, the only reference that I found to anything like this was a very, very short paragraph on the about page. That's really not enough. We do need to know more. Okay, up to the collar. It is a fur collar that I don't think is real fur, which yeah, I, that doesn't bother me at all. This looks nice, it feels nice. It's removable, which I also like. It is held on by one, two, three, four, five, seven buttons, so that's not going anywhere. And the button loops are made of elastic, which I think that is way, way better than trying to do this in leather. For one thing, it's easier to get on, it's less fidgety, and this actually holds it in place better. And also, just look at how well these buttons are, are, are sewn on. And I don't know what it's called when a button is sewn on to, to whatever it might be, the shirt, the jacket, whatever, 
and there's a little space left between the button and the material. And then the, the thread is sort of looped around about that little space so the button really sits off the jacket, shirt, whatever. And that just makes it much easier to button up. I mean, really, Japanese brands, EU brands, American brands, you can learn from this. And then there's the zip. It's a YKK zip, and those are pretty much like, I don't know, every single second thing that I've ever seen with a zip on it seems to come with a YKK zip. They, they know what they're doing when they're making zips. They're, they're standard, they're, they're strong, they're durable, and this is gonna last a distance. I, I really don't have a problem with that. It's maybe not the prettiest zip in the world, but it's gonna keep your jacket done up. And that's pretty important. And actually, the more I, I dive into the details of the jacket, the more it, it really, really bugs me, because the detailing, the fit, the craftsmanship, the, the quality of the construction is really, really great. It's just let down so badly by the materials. It's, it, it's really frustrating. And okay, what else is there to say about the jacket? I say, to be honest, not really all that much. To, to the brand, the jacket maker, I'd like to give you like a little bit of feedback, maybe a little bit of advice on, on narrative. There's just a, a little bit too much left up to assumption here. And with the burden that, that um, well, let's just say it, with the burden of that prejudice that we spoke about earlier, that assumption is, is going to tend towards the bad. Because we don't have any information on, on who you are, or where you're based. The only, the only reason that I knew you were based in Pakistan is because I, I saw that information on the, on the shipping label. And then to, to the people involved. Yes, there is a little bit of a blurb on the about page from the CEO, but that really smacks of, of marketing jargon copy. Jargon copy? Jargon copy. It just doesn't feel very genuine and we don't get to know the people who are behind this brand. There's no pictures of, of that CEO and his team. There's no pictures of the people who are making the jackets. There's no pictures from the factory floor. And so we're left to, to fill in the blanks our, ourselves. There, there's no narrative here uh, that is given to us to, to dispel these assumptions that we, that we automatically have. And then with that, there's no, there's no story for us to get behind. I mean, the, the brands that I mentioned earlier, the brands that I think are doing this, this right, they really concentrate on, on the narrative behind the production that they are using. And so I think this is something that, in order to elevate things, in order to elevate people's perception, this is something that, that you have to work on to, to tell your story. I mean, and really engage with people and let them be your ambassadors out there. Let them tell the story to their friends, to their family, to the people in the forums, to anyone that will listen. Because one thing that I really am sure about and I know about menswear is that we love to talk about this shit. We love to be down the pub Looking at your friend is like, oh, you don't know about that? Let me tell you about this. And that is a powerful thing to be able to leverage. I mean, as I look at your site just now, it just seems a little bit too polished. And it really is very, very polished. Which makes me wonder, is there something that's kind of like hiding behind that? It creates a little bit of suspicion. Suspicion that something might be being hidden. I mean, is it? We don't know. Like, I, I want to look on the positive side here. I really do, because the skills that are needed to put together a jacket in the way that you have, and this is a really well put together, well executed jacket. The skills to do this, I, I think you've got to foster those over time and you've got to support the people in their learning. You've got to develop your team and you've got to, to foster this. And I'd love to see you prove me right in this. Like I, I really, really would. Because the, the burden of proof really, it, it falls on you. Whether that's fair or not, it, it just it really falls on you to, to prove everybody else wrong, to prove my hopes and my assumptions for your brand right. But without anything concrete to contradict the majority of people's assumptions in this, then we're going to tend more in that direction. So in the end, can, can I recommend this jacket? this very one here that I have in my hands. No, sadly, as it stands, I can't. And that is for 
two reasons. The materials, I feel that they are definitely not up to the standard that I'd want to bring into my wardrobe or bring into my life. And the second reason, I don't know anything about you guys. I don't know where you produce, I only found that out afterwards. I don't know anything about how you produce and under what conditions. And I need to know that before I can recommend anything from you guys. As I said before, it is unfortunate that that burden really falls on your side. It falls on you, the jacket maker, to contradict with evidence people's opinions and people's assumptions of you. And it falls to us, the consumer, to take this evidence, to look at it, and to, to make our cons consumer decisions based on that evidence. And more importantly, it actually falls on us to, as the consumer, to, to having our minds changed. I mean, with this jacket, what the jacket maker has done has really proven that they have the potential to make a fucking good jacket. They really do. And really, please do so. Even if it raises the price, which I'm pretty sure it will, actually, I'm guaranteed that it will. But with that, you're gonna get yourself into a sphere where you really have the, the potential to make a difference, to make a really a, a positive impact to the, the country of origin perceptions and the assumptions that come along with that. Or, I don't know, stay in your lane. I, I guess you guys are doing really well. This is just, my opinion, it's my two cents, and it's my uh, attempt to, to bring something positive out of a review that could actually tilt towards being very, very negative for your brand. I am trying to find a way to, 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 to give you back some value, and along with that, doing some good. So, guys, you, you guys out there, because I feel like this whole time I've been speaking just to the jacket maker, uh, the, if you're curious about this, I've left a link down below to the Jacket Maker website. And I mean, I, I agree that the, the price is very, very tempting. However, I would, I would encourage you to, to save up a little bit more. Uh, as it stands at this moment, I'd encourage you to save up a little bit more and then look towards the, the secondhand vintage market. Because for not very much more than the price that this cost, you maybe even the same price at this cost, you can really find some amazing bargains out there. And that's what I wanted to talk about earlier, if you remember. Like, this jacket here, which I, I know, I know this definitely would not be for everyone and I've never ever worn it outside of the house. But yeah, this is a vintage shop piece. This cost me 100 euros in a vintage store in Amsterdam. And there was things hanging there that or are perfectly acceptable to wear for about the same price. So it's worth looking around. And yeah, also link below, there's the CRD sales page. I, uh, with, with, with what we've got up there, especially in terms of leather jackets, uh, there's no bargains to free find. I'll be very honest, these things are crazy fucking expensive. And when you're on your way down there to check all those links, well, you're gonna be passing the like button you're going to be passing the subscribe button. Guys, if you've liked this video, if you've been into it, then yeah, I'd really appreciate it if you give it one of those thumbs up. And if you're into to, to high quality menswear, if you're into denim in particular, then consider hitting that subscribe button because that's pretty much what we're, what we're all about. And do I really, do I need to leave this in the mannequin? I, I don't think I do. Maybe I put this one on instead. Uh, I want to do a video on the Visu jacket quite soon and change is always good. And that just leaving to say, guys, I, I hope everyone is happy and healthy out there. And now, nope, now more than ever, because things have gone so fucking nuts. Uh, we're, we're living in a very different world from, from when we spoke last. So yeah, it's, it's now more important than ever that we really, we do take care of each other. So yeah, please, uh, what I'm trying to say is just, just be kind and I'm gonna see you in the next video.